Kia ora koutou katoa, noe mai, haere mai, and welcome to another Tōnes to Caucus uh, webinar. Today we um, have a lot in store, so before uh, we get into the actual content of the webinar, we will start with a karakia. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, e hi ake ana te atakura, e tio, he huka, he hau hu, so Kira, welcome. We already have about 50 of you online. So welcoming all of you, the Indigenous lands that you're joining us from and the Indigenous lands that both Chrissy and I are broadcasting from today. Um, before I hand over to Christy, I'll just do a brief online virtual housekeeping. Um, so you're all 53 of you online, um, there is the chat room, which is your main way to communicate with myself. Who are, my name is Miriam Sessa from Tui Caucus Te Oakeahine National Network, Hending Sexual Violence Together. Um, as a default, the chat does um, has, have on its two to all panellists. If you just want to talk to Christy and I, you keep that. If you want to talk to everyone, click on that all panellists and it'll give you the option to go all panellists and attendees. And that's the way you can talk to everyone. If you do want to ask a question on the lower panel of your screen, you'll find a Q&A box, and that's how you can ask some questions um, throughout the session. We might try and weave them in, but we'll be doing all the Q&A at the very end. And apart from that, enjoy today, and I will hand over and warmly welcome Christy to our space, and over to you. Kia ora, Miriam. Thanks for the invitation. Nga mihi nui kia koutou katoa. Uh, ko hou mai nei tēnei zui, uh, ko rangatoutou te maunga, ko waitamata te moana, ko te raki pai whenua te rohi, ko oniroa te kainga tuturu, ko kotimana mi ingarangi o pū iwi, ko Grant, Mato, ko Mackendo, ko Trawik, ko Trawatha o pū hapu, uh, ko Christy Trawatha ahau, no, no whāngarei ahau e noho ana. Mōrena koutou. Uh, so um, today we're going to be doing an introduction to community mobilisation and a brief introduction to why I'm doing that for you. Um, so I'm a family violence prevention specialist and um, particularly focus on uh, community mobilisation, community based approaches um, to addressing family violence um, and uh, increasingly moving into the sexual violence prevention space too. Uh, I grew up in Auckland and have spent most of my time there, apart from living in Wellington for uh, a couple of years. Um, my background is in psychology and public health, and um, yeah, all of my study really has been working alongside our work in family violence prevention, trying to build the evidence, because as we all know, we don't have that much to work from, um, really, especially locally. So um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining today. This is really going to be an introduction session. So we're going to do a bit of a once over lightly and there's much more to it but um, this is maybe just a first of some other times that we can talk about community mobilisation. Uh, so first of all what will we cover today? We're going to talk a little bit first about what is community because sometimes we jump straight into community mobilisation and we haven't talked about who and, and where and, and why. Um, so we'll talk about community first and then we'll go into some um, specific stuff around community mobilisation definitions and rationale for using this approach and then the key aspects of community mobilizations, the kind of must-haves in the mix when we're doing community mobilization. I'll give you an example of the Heart Movement, which is a piece of work I've been involved with for 10 years now um, that's in the Tamaki community in Auckland. Uh, and then the last part will be sharing briefly um, an analysis from um, Angus McFarlane Fiawa Fedia Braided Rivers model uh, that looks at the Etu Fano approach and the Western evidence on community mobilization. So we'll do all that really quickly in 40 minutes, off we go. Um, first of all, community, sometimes we think of as this kind of static sorry, thing. Sorry, Christine, um, I was just going to, sorry to interrupt, I was just thinking, did we want to ask the group around what community mobilization or, or um, social transformation initiatives they've been part of? Did we want to add that into the group chat? Yes, absolutely. And thinking, yes, as practitioners, but more so in your own lives, what are the movements you've been a part of? You know, sometimes we say social movement, sometimes we say community mobilisation. So get into your, you know, 
yes, work, but also your personal life? Where, where have you really been a part of something that's made change? And I think that for me is such the unique concept and, and cool link between the professional work and the activist, um, you know, social change, troublemaker, radical, um, but, you know, really the instigators of social transformation and how we link those two together um, gets me quite excited. So, yeah, let us know in the chat so that um, we can slowly link that back into Christy and she can get to know you all better. Yeah, so when we're talking about community, we often just think about a group of people with something in common. Um, there may be shared values, there may be a shared sense of identity, inter interdependence between community members and a sense of belonging within that community. Communities generate social behaviour through norms. So they're not um, absolutely fixed, they can change between different people within the group, but on the whole, there are norms that are created within our different communities. It's really important to understand that communities are not homogenous, they're diverse, and difference and conflict are normal aspects of community life. So they're not things that have, you know, that are unusual. There are things there, things that are very common, and difference is very common. So we need to think about that when we're thinking community. Um, I just wanted to make this point that Ledworth made about um, you know, these kind of utopian concepts we have of community, which are very attractive to many of us that think about how do we live um, in communities that support each other, that can deal with their own problems, that are positive places to be. It's important to recognize that when we do talk about unity and harmony over difference and diversity, that can silence and oppress minority groups. So when we're thinking about queer community, people of color, um, you know, any minority group, when you just take that, you know, it's all about us being one and homogenizing, that can be really unhelpful. Um, so here's a couple of de definitions of community. One is from Ledworth, who, that, which is quite academic, okay? So it talks about a complex interrelation, a complex system of interrelationships that are woven around social distance, diverse histories and cultures, and determined in the present by our political and social trends. So that's quite an academic level, right? Here's something a bit more pedestrian from me, um, and particularly this focus on geographic communities that I've held for a number of years. So what I'm saying is it's a group of people who live in the same location. They're connected through shared identity, which is based on that location, the use of shared resources, supermarkets, parks, library, schools, and to some degree social connections, because we know in a lot of um, people's lives, their direct connections are not physical connections um, in their local community, it's more online. It's, um, we can travel more, all of these things, but what I'm focused on is localization, I guess, and through COVID we've seen how important localization um, can be and being connected to our local communities that people think is not important sometimes anymore. Uh, there are many different types of communities. The three that we talk about the most is a community of identity. So we share the same identity. It might be ethnicity, it might be um, sexual orientation. Um, so you share an identity and that connects you. A geographic community, as I just said, is more place-based. And then an interest community. So that might be, um, we've got a whole lot, actually, I've got a whole lot of examples of interest communities on the next slide. Um, it's really important to recognise there are many overlaps between our different types of communities. So here's a couple of different types of communities. In here, we've got geographic identity interest. Um, all of these communities have different ways of being together. They'll have different norms, varied levels of social um, cohesion, varied, varying levels of um, of belonging, but yeah, just to think about, you know, when we're thinking about communities, don't just think place, think, you know, think lots of different aspects of, of what community can be. Okay, so there's a little bit of a base in community, lots more to say about that, of course. Um, but now let's get into community mobilization. So when we're talking about mobilizing communities, it can be any of those different types of community. But community mobilization is a specific approach. It's a transformative approach used to create change on complex issues. It's a long-term and multifaceted strategy. It uses capacity building to engage large numbers of community members in local action for change. 
Okay, so this is not an approach that you use for a simple problem. If there is a simple problem in your community, there are much easier ways to address it than mobilizing all of the people eventually, hopefully, in your place. This is for the really hard stuff. This is for stuff like family violence and sexual violence. It's for stuff like uh, addressing HIV. Um, mainly, this, all of this work has come from India and Africa, and it's been around gender-based violence and HIV. So it's for those big and very difficult um, things to address in society. Um, what it does is it builds leadership and decision making, the operational capabilities of community members to make change on complex issues. So this is about upskilling community members to be able to do stuff in their own community that doesn't rely on them being, um, you know, a community mobilization specialist or a family violence or sexual violence specialist. Um, what community mobilization does, it shifts decision making and action from external organizations um, to community members and groups within the community supported by local organizations. So very much specific to a community, whether it's place or interest or identity. Um, one of the key things about community mobilization is it elic elicits critical thinking and inspires action to replace negative norms so in our case, family and sexual violence, all of the norms that feed into that with positive norms. So it's a transformational way of working. Um, the rationale for community mobilization, um, there are many reasons to, to use this approach, but one of them is the size of the problem of family and sexual violence means that we need new approaches. We cannot service our way out of these problems. Um, it's just too, the scale is too large, it affects too many people. Um, community mobilisation is a recommended primary prevention strategy. So for those who know that language around primary prevention, that comes from public health, that means it's a universal approach. It um, is for all of us, not just those who are directly impacted um, by violence, either experiencing it or using it. It's for all of us. Um, it's a large scale approach. It's about getting, you know, a critical mass or the majority of community members involved in some way over a long period of time. It's a long term approach. Um, it's community specific. So you work with the strength and context of the place or people you're working with. It's a way to coordinate action from the bottom up. So, you know, we're, we're doing many things to try and coordinate actions around family and sexual violence. When we get into local place, the people and organizations are much more visible, it's much more tangible at the local level, I believe, from having a look from top down and bottom up to coordinate our efforts. Also, this work is not just focused on uh, making change for an individual, one family, one whanau. This is a focus on social change. This is all of us, and it's gonna take some time. Um, so this slide is, um, you might have seen it before, but it just kind of demonstrates a little bit of a shift that we're doing when we talk about community mobilization. So the first, who wants to change? Yes, yes, me, me, always, right? We all want change. Who wants to change? That's when it gets a little harder, you know? People are not necessarily so willing um, to make changes themselves. And particularly if they don't see themselves as being violent or having, um, you know, holding norms that discriminate in these things, but actually, there are many changes we all need to make to enable uh, a different way of relating in our communities and society to create the change we need to stop family and sexual violence. So um, with this, with community mobilization, you cannot sit on the outside as a professional with a wall in front of you and you know that you don't have to go through. It will take you through the wall. It will be uncomfortable. And uh, I hope that <laughs> if you join this sort of way of working that it will make your life better in time, but it's, um, it's a growth process. It's not simple. It's not um, always fun. Now, um, this thing about coordinated community response. So um, on the left, you'll see a diagram um, that we used to use a lot and it's not okay. Um, and it's a really helpful way for us to think about all the different players that are necessary um, to work together in communities. Um, but on the right, you'll see sometimes in reality, it looks quite different. And this beautiful diagram here that I <laughs> was together one day um, is, um, 
is just trying to look at the complexity of these relationships a little bit more. So you can see um, some of the, the, the wedges are organisations or kind of key community groups or um, stakeholders, whatever you want to call them. Some are well connected, but often there are, um, there are issues that make our relationships difficult to work together, right? And we all know what this feels like in community, in government, um, in academia, all over the shop. Um, you know, there are many things that get in our way. Sometimes our people end up being on the outside and they're not our primary focus. The services and the system becomes our primary focus. So when we're talking about um, community mobilisation and bringing, you know, coordinating all those efforts from the bottom up, we really need to think about bringing our people back into the centre. And that it is our responsibility as professionals, as organisations, to heal these rifts. That is up to us. That is our job, right? Yeah. Um, so in my academic work, um, I've looked at community mobilisation for some time now. And what I really um, wanted to figure out was what are the key domains um, or essential aspects of community mobilization? So this is kind of an important slide, this one, and we'll take a little bit of time here to, um, to talk through it. Um, so through um, an extensive literature review, these are the domains of community mobilization that I've identified. They've also been confirmed by an international group of researchers who used a different approach, quite a different method, and also came up with these same domains. Okay, so we can have some certainty now that these are the core things that are needed to um, mobilize communities. This drew from the community development literature, uh, community empowerment, community participation, you know, all of those different approaches that we know about and talk about. Um, we, I drew and also they drew from that. Um, both in both cases, we drew from the academic literature and the grey literature. So that's all of the stuff that's like reports um, that's a, that are available to everyone. So it's probably no surprise um, to you that leadership is a key aspect and it's central in, um, in the diagram here. Leadership is really essential, but leadership at all levels. So this is not just our existing and traditional leaders. This is about activating the leadership that all of us can bring um, to an issue like family violence or sexual violence. Um, and that can take some development. It's got, you know, like it's, it's, um, it's sort of, you know, you have to learn it as you do it. When you start doing leadership in these spaces in a community setting, sometimes you get things wrong. It takes a long time to get it right. Um, and you're always, always learning. So it's about our existing leaders. It's about our potential leaders and community members particularly, but it's also about our most quiet voices. How do we get the, um, the whakaro, the thoughts, the ideas from our people who are our thoughtful people, but they're not the ones to stand up? With community mobilization, there's a place for all the different types of leadership. And of course, it's about informing our existing and most visible leaders about the issues we're talking about and making sure that they have the skills and resources they need to lead on this stuff properly. Um, so organisation is another um, key aspect. Um, it's all of the, the structures and resources that are used to mobilise people. So it's the, um, the networks, it's the um, you know, FTE resource, it's all of that stuff that helps. And that's you know, something we can also probably think, yes, I imagine that that's in the mix. Shared concern, um, again, is something we know has got to be there, right? People have to care about a problem enough to go from being passive to active. And, um, you know, like with family violence and sexual violence in Aotearoa, I think we have a high level of shared concern, yeah? But how do we actually make that active? And community mobilisation is approached to activate that, to give people lots of different options and for them to create their own ways of, um, contributing to these efforts. Again, participation is probably, you know, one of those things you think, yes, has to happen. Um, with community mobilisation, what we're trying to do is engage increasing numbers of community members in action over time. So this is large scale. This is not just those who are most, um, most likely to be involved. 
This is about as many people as possible in different ways. It's our local businesses, it's our local churches, it's our tradies, you name it. It's all of the different people in our communities uh, having some connection to this work, some action, some change in thinking, which takes me to a really important aspect of community mobilisation and maybe something that, um, that you might not think of straight away. So critical consciousness. This is a concept, um, this is a Freire, Paolo Freire really is kind of one of the key people um, that is associated with critical consciousness, but also the feminist movement has used critical consciousness raising for a very long time. What critical consciousness is, it's about deepening our understanding of an issue and the causes of the issue through dialogue, through conversation. So when we talk about family violence and sexual violence, you know, the, if you talk to um, someone just, you know, a new person you meet, they'll often say, oh, well, that's caused by drugs and alcohol, eh? And you go, well, yeah, that's um, something that contributes to it, but actually there's some bigger stuff that causes it, yeah? So when you start to talk about gender and inequality, colonization, discrimination, and to have these conversations, you've got to create spaces that are safe and comfortable for people to go into these gnarly places they don't necessarily want to go or aren't used to going. Um, and it's not just one conversation. I, I think often within this work, we think, you know, like, let's have a bit of a talk about this, right, they've, they've got it, you know, like, move on. No, this is about a long-term process of change because we're talking about um, some things that are so um, the air that we breathe that most of us can't see them, smell them, feel them, yeah? So critical consciousness is a key aspect. And um, in the example I'm going to uh, share with you soon, the heart movement, we create what, what's called like safe social spaces to talk about this stuff. Lots of different types of groups. Uh, it's not a counselling session. It's just humans coming together and having a talk on a particular topic. So yeah, that's a big one. The other big one is social cohesion. So community mobilization can only get the participation, et cetera, the scale that it needs when a community has some level of social cohesion. Um, and so that is a there's a key aspect that will um, that will accelerate or hinder um, a, so a community mobilization initiative. That's about the relationships people have with each other. It's about, um, you know, people sometimes say the loose networks within the community or the social glue, but what it enables is a willingness to act together to address a, an issue that concerns a lot of community members. So that's a really key element. And in the example I'm going to talk about later with the heart movement, um, which is in Tamaki, Gleninus, Point England, Pam Muir in Auckland, um, that's a community that's had a big disruption through a transformational housing initiative that has really made a big impact on the social fabric of the community. Um, so yeah, that um, has been a real challenge for the heart movement in increasing mobilization. Okay, we might come back to that one in the questions later, but um, here's an example. Here's the heart movement. Um, this photo is from a Manawahine event um, in Te Oro, um, the Music and Arts Centre in Glen Innes. Uh, in 2018. So um, just some of the people who are involved in the heart movement, all the wahine for this one. Um, the heart movement is a, a long-term family violence prevention initiative. The long-term goal, which is a 20-year plan of change, is that Tamaki homes actively grow loving, safe and supportive relationships. So um, in 2008, the community came together and made a commitment to addressing family violence. They wanted to do a long-term preventative approach um, that built the capacity of community members to do for themselves, to make change for themselves. There were social work approaches and still are and counselling services available, but people recognised this wasn't making the level of change that was needed. Um, so the heart movement was um, launched in 2012 um, and the home organization for the heart movement is Te Waipuna Pōwai, part of the Sisters of Mercy. And um, this piece of work was really strongly supported by a key person um, in the Tamaki community at that time, Kua Miriamaka. Um, so she's passed now, 
Uh, but without her leadership, this would never have happened. Yeah. Um, on the left here, we see some other amazing leaders, um, Margaret and Tom Ngāpera, uh, who are local, um, local people and also have been um, ministers in Glen Innes for many years. They've now passed that um, on to one of their daughters. But their story of change uh, is well known within the community and they're the sort of people that we can put on a poster and say, you know, we're, we're a part of this. Um, they've inspired many people's story of change. Um, so that was something very early on we did in the Heart Movement. Heart works both to prevent family violence and promote healthy relationships. So it's um, it's a little unusual in that respect. And that call had come that came from the community. They said we don't want to only address um, try and reduce negative statistics. We want to try and create positive change in the community. So. Um, those of us involved took on that challenge and have been working with it ever since. Um, it certainly does take you into a different place when you start talking about healthy relationships, um, as well as preventing family violence. So there's the website there if you want to go and have a look, um, you can get a much sort of bigger feel of what the heart movement is about. Um, so we have a theory of change that guides the work of the heart movement. Um, that was developed in collaboration with a whole range of um, practitioners and community members uh, in the heart movement. We blend the, the, the divide um, is sort of gone between uh, practitioner and community member. Um, it's much more together than it has been on any other piece of work um, I've been involved with. So the theory of change has two strands of action. One is community mobilization. The other is capacity and collaboration development. Initially, we kind of thought that that was more for our organisations, but in time, um, all of those training spaces are open now to community members as well. And that training um, has been one of the key things in the first um, years for HEART and continues to be to really build local capacity um, around all of the related issues around family violence, sexual violence, um, drug and alcohol issues, mental health, um, parenting, child development, you name it, if people ask for it, it happens. So um, yeah, the pictures we've got here are from the Heart Awards every year. The people who have contributed really special things to the Heart Movement are acknowledged in the community. So yeah, here's some of the faces again. Um, bit blurry, sorry about that. Um, so you know, I talked in the beginning about leadership being a key aspect of community mobilisation. For the heart movement, we call our local leaders change agents, and they are the engine room of the heart movement. So they're mainly volunteers. Some are also practitioners in the community. Some are practitioners in other communities who live in Glen Innes, Point England, um, Pam Muir, um, and they commit to getting more involved in the heart movement. They commit to building their own capacity um, and learning um, about how to talk about this, this area, uh, and also how to make change starting at home. So this isn't about, um, you know, coming along and being part of something and, you know, everyone pretending that they don't know that there's violence or some unhealthy relationships happening at home. In heart, it's okay to, um, to there are spaces to talk about, um, you know, the things that the people sort of involved in leading um, are struggling with themselves. It's very real in that aspect, um, but also that recognition that we can't lead change within our community when things are not okay at home. So really starting at home, whether it's, you know, my home might be safe, but actually I've got family, whānau members who are not safe. And so um, helping, you know, to have those conversations before we try and speak to our whole community and say, you know, come on guys, healthy relationships. Um, just keeping it, keeping it real. Um, some of our um, key change agents have been part of a personalised leadership development um, program that's got really highly skilled um, leadership coaches. And so what we're trying to do with HEART in lots of ways is take that really high level capacity building stuff right to the grassroots. So it's not that you have to be an expert practitioner before you're able to access these, um, you know, these awesome um, trainings, courses, etc. It's about getting those great people, really high skilled trainers, right into grassroots community and saying, you know, 
what would you guys like to learn about next? Um, yeah, a lot of, um, in the next session that we do, people from Heart will be involved and they'll be able to talk about the process of leadership development for them, which has been quite, um, it's been pretty massive for some of our people, which is really exciting. Um, so our change agents are involved in running heaps of activity in Heart. They're involved in planning and decision making, but they're also involved in, um, you know, they kind of, they drop the stone that ripples throughout the community. So the best example of that, um, best easy example is when this question, what is a healthy relationship was raised in the community um, in 2012 when we launched the Heart Movement. That rippled for about three years through every place and space in the community. People were talking about it in school, they were talking about it at work, they were talking about it in heart meetings, they were talking about it at touch, you know, everywhere. So um, what that does is our change agents have these conversations. That just came spontaneously and we just gave it as much energy as we could to keep going. But change agents will take a topic or some new knowledge out and start talking with friends, whānau, um, their networks about it. And then there's a ripple of information that comes back in from them. So what friends and whānau have said, what the next questions are, you know, is that what we need to be talking about? All of that stuff, had, there's a communication mechanism within the community. Um, so yeah, conversation is one of the most important things. It's our, one of our biggest resources for critical consciousness raising and it's our most accessible free resource. So um, yeah, have a chat, <laughs> always a good approach. Um, they also run um, events and local action, um, you know, communications, media and local campaigns, front local campaigns, tell their story, amazingly brave people in the community. Um, and, uh, you know, lots of work around art, music, theatre and movies. This is social movement. And when, um, you know, these are like local films, but also feature films that the community has been involved in participating in. Uh, plays that are held in the beautiful Music and Arts Centre um, that have been put on specifically around family violence, sexual violence, mental health, you name it, art exhibitions, youth music projects. This is not about just coming into the room and having a hard talk. This is about seeing the messages about um, how we want our community to be and the changes we're making to create that everywhere we go. So um, Hart has um, done quite a lot of research and evaluation work for a small community project that um, is mainly funded via philanthropic funds, and we're very grateful for those. I should have a like line of funders here. Um, I was going to talk about that today and realised that there just isn't time to talk about all of that. Maybe that's another session, but um, there's a couple of different tools that we've used. The Community Readiness Assessment, three assessments now have been completed using that. That assesses how prepared a community is to address a problem. Um, the Aotearoa Community Mobilisation Questionnaire is a tool that I developed in my PhD to address our need to quantify change in communities around community mobilisation. So we can't only rely on story, unfortunately, and qualitative and anecdotal evidence. We also need some numbers um, and that tool has been used once now for Tāmaki, also Rānui in um, Waitakere um, and looking at the differences between. But that's a whole other conversation to share that um, with you. We've also just recently had an impact evaluation completed by Rachel Trotman at Weave um, that has um, looked at the first eight years pretty much of Hart's work and, and shows you know where we are making progress and where we're not. And we're really um, keen to talk about the, you know, the things that we've learned, the hard bits too. Like um, it's, it's really important that we don't try and say that anything is a silver bullet. This is not a silver bullet. This is developmental, this is iterative. We're learning as we go. We learn every year, we learn every week sometimes about where we need to go and learn more. So yeah, absolutely um, humble in our learning that you know um, we've got a long way to go, long, long way to go. Um, now a bit of a shift here to looking at um, Hiawa Feria, the Braided Rivers model, which was developed by Professor Angus McFarlane. Um, I wanted to bring this in here because um, it looks at, mainly I've spoken to you so far about from the Western evidence, that's my area of expertise. 
um, I was invited by Etu Fano to um, do an analysis of the Western evidence alongside their work um, and um, was introduced to Te Awa, um, to Te Awa Whiria from uh, by Anne Dysart and so um, to me this was just it was a really important tool to be introduced to and um, so Mason Drury's research is the interface is another um, similar tool to this that you might want to have a look at if you're interested. So um, the Hiawa Feria uses the metaphor of streams of a, of a river to describe the complex and dynamic relationship between Cup of Māori and Western evidence. So um, what um, Professor McFarlane says is that when the streams of knowledge, and I'll take you to the streams, when the streams of knowledge come together, it's a place for learning. It's not about assimilation, it's about learning from each other. But um, he developed this model because he saw there was um, a real lack of space for Kaupapa Māori approaches within mainstream or Western or government or decision-making spaces. So um, what this Braided Rivers model does is to really acknowledge the two streams that most of the time they run um, apart, but they come together and this is the analogy of on the riverbed, and then move apart again. So those learning times when they come together. Um, I recently wrote a short paper about this, um, which is accessible um, in the references, and you can read a little bit more about that and about the approach, but I think it's very timely for us um, to learn more about this, and also for us Pākehā researchers and practitioners to be part of this conversation, not just leave um, the development of Kaupapa Māori, um, Te Ao Māori worldview, you know, to our Māori colleagues, yeah. Um, so um, the example for the analysis, the Hiawa Awa Whiria analysis, is Etu Fano. Etu Fano has been running since 2008. It's a community mobilisation strategy that's based in a Te Ao Māori worldview. Uh, the long or the um, vision for Itu Fano is Te Manakaha o Te Fano, so strong, safe, prosperous Fano that are active um, within their community, living with a clear sense of identity, cultural integrity, and control over their own destiny. So that's the Kaupapa. It's a family violence prevention initiative. It's based in the Ministry of Social Development um, and is across the country. So um, drawing from the evidence. Um, of Etu Fano and the evaluations they've completed alongside my work in the Western Evidence on Community Mobilisation. This is kind of a, a core part of that analysis. So what this table shows is um, my first attempt at looking at um, where are the similarities between the approaches. And I'm not saying this is the be all and end all, this is a first go at it and I'm happy to be critiqued on it. Um, but what, um, what it showed quite clearly when I was learning from Itu Fano and what I know about community mobilization is there are many, many synergies. So, um, you know, there's a lot of leadership focus within Itu Fano. The kahukura are the local leaders, what we would call maybe change agents in the heart movement. The principles and approaches of mana, manaki, tikanga uh, are very aligned to leadership. They have a center of excellence, which is very aligned to organization. Um, participation happens through community collaborations and the way they work with aroha and are welcoming manaki into the initiative. Um, the shared concern um, seems to happen through um, messaging tools, resources, support and this thing about kōrero api. So when we speak, we speak in ways that are supportive, are helpful, are kind, are compassionate. Um, and you know this key aspect around critical consciousness that I mentioned earlier within Etu Fano and Tikanga Māori approaches, Wānanga is a space that is ideally suited, does that, and so much more within that Wānanga space. So when we're thinking in the Western space, like, oh, how are we going to get into these conversations? Māori already have that set up. All of the components are there to have these conversations, and that's a key approach that Etu Fano use. Um, within communities. When we talk social cohesion um, in the Western evidence, in Itu Fano, Whakapapa, Tanaunga Tanga, deep, deep connections. And of course, you know, within social cohesion, within Whakapapa, Tanaunga Tanga connections, 
there are things that bring us together and there are things that are push us apart. So it's not to say it's simple and perfect and everything is harmonious, but um, yeah, some really, really, really key synergies there. Um, I guess the, the main findings are just the similarities between a grassroots iterative 10 years of working in communities approach and the Western evidence. Um, what the Western evidence is really good at showing is the what. So for community mobilization, what we need to do. The Kaupapa Māori evidence goes a bit further and it says how we do it. It uses uh, Māori values tikanga to show us how for Māori communities, um, community mobilization works best. And I think we can all learn a lot from the Kaupapa Māori approaches of bringing people together and how to support change. So there's heaps of references because, you know, I'm a bit academic and um, you can have a look at those in your own time. Kia ora. Kia ora and thank you, Chrissy. That, um, I just was sitting here and, um, you know, you have those lots of aha moments and those moments where, you know, your heart sings of your, my values and beliefs were being reflected by your practice. So thank you so much for this presentation for me. Um, you know, my my start of this professional work really comes from the grassroots um, and, you know, seeing how we can affect change still from, you know, practitioner professional level, but really go back to, um, you know, to that grassroots space. And I love some of the comments that you made, which one of them was really like, a, I took it as a, you know, a real responsibility for myself and my role was the rifts that exist in our communities that are generated by us, that are our responsibility to heal. So I really heard that and took that on board. Um, but, the, you know, the whole transformative approach and how, what parts of ourselves need to enter the transformation as we encounter and engage in that critical consciousness with our communities was um, really sang true to me. I thought I'd just introduce you to our audience because as you've been talking, um, they've been busy um, telling us a bit about themselves. So we've got a wealth of practitioners. We've got 72 people still online. And some of the things that they've been involved in is eco-activism, community-led regenerative kai systems, um, in particular revitalizing Mataranga Māori, wellness tools. Um, there's also alcohol harm reduction in the mix. We've also got lots of gender-based violence. Um, both here and overseas, um, some people working currently with what's going on in America, some people working around also political lobbying around some um, land rights in Samoa, rainbow community, sexuality, education, Pacifica empowerment, and hopefully I've managed to capture all of those who shared um, as you are going. So now we're going to get into the Q&A, so thank you for those who have um, put some questions in the box. We will keep an eye on the chat and on the Q&A box. So type them through because I, I, I know that it's generated a lot of um, what, like, how does all this all work and where does it go from here and how do I, you know, put all of this into action is where my brain often goes because I'm quite a, I'm one of those pragmatic learners of going, I want to, I love all the theory, but I love putting it into action. So one of the first questions is, um, do you see a tension between the benefits of identity politics and the benefits of broader solidarity. And there's a, the person follows up with, you know, between identity group promotion and social cohesion and how those fit together. Wow, that's a pretty hard question to start with. It's a big one. It sounds like that. I thought, I thought I'd start there, you know, with one of the hard ones, because then we can have a bit of time talking about it. Because I found that really interesting too. Of like, yes, like in particular what you said before around difference and conflict are normal. And when we talk about harmony, I think that's when the person actually popped in this question, can marginalise those voices, but how does identity politics and social cohesion fit in that picture? Which yeah. is quite a big question. Thank you for asking. I know. It's a hard know. question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think inclusion is is what we maybe is the, the place that it comes together, because what we need to do in communities and society is to make places more inclusive of diversity, right? So that doesn't mean, yeah, that doesn't mean that we bland out and we pretend everyone's the same and homogenous, that we really celebrate diversity. We see diversity as a strength um, and that it's okay to be ourselves wherever we are. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to answer that question properly just off the bat there. Yeah, it's a bit maybe, 
we can do it as a follow-up in our second session, which would be a question for all of you. Maybe we can talk more about this offline. Because I thought that was a very poignant, deep question. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so the next question is, um, social cohesion is critical to community mobilization, yet this can also become a barrier for communities in discussing family violence. Mm -hmm. How have you overcome this in your experience? Mm. So um, for um, groups within communities that are more resistant to having these conversations, it's about starting with individual community members who are ready to have the conversation. I think um, we need to recognise how long it's taken for us to get into this state that family and sexual violence are so normalised. We have to have a long-term approach to get ourselves out of this state, right? So starting with those individuals within communities who are the most open or are wanting to have these conversations, supporting them, building their capacity, developing a community of practice, and in time, um, you know, starting to work further into that community. One of the things I think we can do is show people how to do it, those who are the most resistant to not, um, you know, like we used to say with the heart movement and with it's not okay, go with the open doors. And that's not to deny that the most harm might be happening well away from the open door, right? Like we know that. But um, we have to be able to show people what it is to come into these sorts of things and how it's possible and who to take leadership from others and that kind of positive um, peer pressure almost of, um, well, these, these guys have managed to do something here and you know, it's slowly, it's, you know, it's just the beginning, but we've started to open the conversation. And I think the main thing is time, like the intention, holding the intention, having a small group with you that can, um, that are ready to go into it, and then time and strategy. Yeah. And I suppose that that reminds me a lot of it's, and we were talking about this before the session started, that that parallel between the community process and the individual process around healing is similar when you work with individuals around their healing. You start with what's open, what's accessible, not with what's shut and closed. You don't try and break down people's resistances or defences. You might work with what's available to them in the moment. So it's similar. That parallel between community healing and individual healing, I think, is really a powerful part of this model. Yeah, and more than I ever realised, you know, when you stay in when you try and hold primary prevention, it's a very, um, there aren't many people that just focus on the prevention aspects of this work. So holding that, like I've held that probably a little too tightly, and then I see in the heart movement how much it's activated healing as well. So mm. prevention and healing are very connected things. And when we talk large scale prevention, we're also bringing people with um, who have experienced harm, who have perpetrated harm into the mix and yeah, those who are your champions with prevention often have a story um, of healing that goes alongside that. Yeah. And um, from your models that you presented that you invited um, critique, I love um, I love seeing that. And I love seeing people picking that up and actually offering you some really great critique in the chat. So if you're willing, I, I, we can just throw some of them around. One person thought that the, the slide with the two... Um, like the, the table actually wasn't really representing it well and suggested a Venn diagram, um, yeah. which I thought visually could actually be quite interesting because they were thinking of, there were so many overlaps between all the concepts that, um, and that's always that tension, I think, of needing to make sense of information and categorise and then looking at the links and the overlaps. So, yeah, really interesting. Um, and then it, the thinking that it's a bit awkward trying to categorise Māori approaches into a table with Western equivalents because they don't really match because um, they're two completely different ways. Um, so those were really interesting, great critiques. So thank you for those for bringing them forward and thank you for you for inviting them. Another um, question, which I think is also interesting about knowledges and um, good to unpack for ourselves. So it's Western evidence. A uh, lot of this um, evidence around community mobilization has been generated from various contracts, for example, Raising Voices in Uganda, um, Raising Voices SA, S, is it, or Sasa, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, um, in Uganda. Um, so, yeah, that's a really interesting point. Like, as you said, there's lots of community mobilisation isn't being developed in traditional, what we could call Western or European or European-American, because I, I always struggle with that word Western because I, I find it quite um, vague. I'm like, what are we actually talking about? And sometimes I think we're actually talking about English-speaking countries more than 
West, like I, I don't know what Western means sometimes. So love to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, well, um, perfect for the person that mentioned raising voices and stuff up because that is the like shining light of community mobilization. And that's why I reference Laurie Michaud's work so much. Um, so that really informed um, my masters, which informed the heart movement. Um, and there's a connection ongoing with raising voices in Uganda, which has spread to you know a lot of countries internationally. But yeah, they've sort of led the way for um, this approach. And you're absolutely right when you know um, most of the evidence does come from India and Africa. So it it gets into the Western evidence, but it's from um, non-Western context. So yeah. Yeah, good point. Yeah, great. Um, another question has just popped through. I find, find communities overworked by government agencies. I don't see this getting better. Um, as more and more central agency awareness grows about the fact that not only do they not fully understand the problem, but they also want to hold the solution. How do you look after the community energy and recognise its value? So that really interesting thing is, which I can connect to what I was observing is, um, what you're talking about often isn't reflected in how these initiatives are funded and how um, government thinks always about um, change and wants to, you know, the need for funding blocks and uh, accountability and, you know, how do we measure change? So, yeah, what are your thoughts? And let's start there because I didn't mention that, you know, when I showed that fractured diagram, we have to recognise that the contracting approaches that have been and that still exist have made that happen as well eh? so it's not only the responsibility when I talk about our responsibility I mean all of us you know government NGO you name it all of us together um, yes absolutely get what you're saying about maybe over involvement of government at the community level and I think what we really need to figure out at the moment is how we work together as a team that works with our strengths so in our lane how do we stay in our lane but be a really good team member um, because no one partner, no one stakeholder can do all of it, right? No one can. We each have specific roles. Some of those are legislated roles, right? So that's really clear what we can do, what we should do, and what we must do. Others of us have much broader roles, right? So NGOs and communities have much broader roles, much broader scope. But I think that's the thing. We need to do, for our government agencies, we need to do our core business really really well we need to be absolutely great at it and then let others do the other parts that mm. is their core business that they're great at yes we can all learn from each other the more we know about how other organizations work the better it helps us to understand the whole system that we work within but I think that would be the thing I would say um, particularly about that and community energy um, that's yeah that's really important and I think you've got to have the stuff that fills you up as communities of practice, as local communities working on this stuff. Um, most of the people that work in the in the NGO um, sector have been doing it for many years. You know, many of our colleagues have been working on these problems for 30 years, 40 years, 20 years, whatever it might be. Um, we need to understand how we do self-care and collective care of our people much better. We're working on some of the gnarliest stuff and we're not really thinking about ourselves. And I think I've learned that from people who have come before me and have become unwell because of the work and the inability to stop and, and look after themselves. And I really, you know, if you hang around with me very much, you'll find that I talk about that stuff quite a lot, about how to look after ourselves, how to look after each other. And this thing about let's be a team together. Let's Let's just shift this dynamic that comes from the awfulness of our work at times, which is um, conflict and always being in conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. Where are the shared spaces? How do we become a team? No matter which different organisation you sit in, how can we work together better and be compassionate and acknowledge what each other, the strengths we bring? Mm -hmm. Don't only focus on the hard stuff. So we've got quite a shift to make. Yeah. No, um, I wonder if um, oh, I was just reflecting on this the other day, actually, how much, you know, some of the social movements to get the urgency of the situation, they have to start from like highlighting the negative um, because that's how we create urgency in our society and, and build that, you know, shared understanding and shared um, shared uh, acceptance that actually this is a problem. But then so it's quite a um, 
quite a gymnastics within ourselves almost of going, I can talk about the negative and the and highlight that as well as them flipping and being really connected to the strengths and the positive and this community cohesion. So that takes um, quite a lot of um, flexibility of ourselves as practitioners to be able to be in both spaces and know how to articulate them differently at different times. So, yeah, 100%. Yeah, and to be led by what the community is saying, not what we think. That's a really hard shift for us as practitioners to go, these guys want to talk about healthy relationships, but when are we going to talk about child sexual abuse? Like that needs to be talked about in good time. Yeah, yeah. when yeah. they're ready. Yeah, because this is not the only problem people are dealing with, right? When you're dealing with, um, you know, like life is complex, when you're dealing with income challenges, when you're dealing with um, mental health issues, you know, there are many, many things and just having very busy lives means we can't go everywhere all at once. Yeah. And different people at different times, thinking about passing the baton rather than running the whole marathon by ourselves, right? Yeah, and that, and that's definitely those lessons that we get from Frere around his process of con um, conscientization um, is you work with where the community at, is at and you work with what's dear to their hearts and that's when the the gold and the you know the the transformation occurs um so we've got a few, few more minutes and unless there are other questions maybe oh i just had another question pop up um oh no it's just a kia so maybe she'll is this time to put the poll out for the group so with christy we do have another session booked in and instead of just um rocking and rolling how we thought um we would what you might need next we thought we would try and role model some community mobilization and ask the group what do you want to see next so we have a poll um, and we came up with some different options but if the option you really want to see in next session which will be in a couple of weeks time um, if it's not there then put it in the chat because the chat does get saved and we can collect all that information as well um, so oh the we'll leave this open for a little bit so please do put in your your preferred options because we really want to tailor the next session to your needs. We're, we're getting quite a significant. Oh no, there's a few few different options. So I'll close it in a ten seconds. And closing now, so we can share the results. O overall, planning community mobilization and measuring change were the two that came on top. And um, and there's other things that could be woven in there. So I'll make sure I capture all of that information. Thank you everyone for participating. Are there any final things you would like to share, Christy, before we um, close up? You're getting a lot of kia ora, thank you. Um, lots of wonderful messages of um, uh, thanking you for the um, for the for today. Is there any final comments before we close? No, just thanks for coming, guys. Um, yeah, let's keep going. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll just close with a karakia. Unihia, unihia, unihia ki te uru tapunui, kia wātia, kia māma, te nākau, te tinana, te wairua i te ara takata, ko i rā rā i rungo, a kairia a ke runga, kia tīna, tīna, huie, pāhie. Kia ora everyone, thank you Christy, we will see Christy again in a couple of weeks, the recordings will be available on YouTube and we'll send an email out as soon as they are ready, which should hopefully be this weekend. Kia ora and we'll see you all soon. Mm -hmm.